Hello, everyone. Welcome to Listening to Lancaster. I'm Diana Martin with Hourglass, and it's my pleasure to be joined today by three community school directors at the School District of Lancaster, Bianca Cordova, Phoebe Radcliffe, and Alex Rohr. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. us. Um, I would love to get to know each of you a little bit more and why you wanted to get into this work, but I think we should probably start off by talking about what a community school is. This might not be something that is familiar to everyone who is watching and listening. Um, so let's start there. What is a community school and what does a community school director do? So it's a great question with so many answers. Um, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. I'll start with the fanciest way, which is that um, it's really a macro level public health intervention. Uh, but what that looks like is uh, our goal is to create a more equitable education and experience for our students and our families in our community. So our goal is for schools to become a safe place for kids to grow, for their families to grow. And as community schools, we work with different partners, local organizations and individuals to grow on the strengths that we already see in our community and then to fill in those gaps um, in various different areas that we'll get into. Is this something that is a national model? Where did the idea behind community schools originate? It is a national model. So uh, it's seen all over the country. We were lucky to go to the national conference this past June was held in Philly um, and get to talk with folks that are doing this everywhere. And the cool thing is it looks really different wherever it is uh, because the model can really be tailored to your school and your community. Um, and it's a great opportunity. That conference is a great opportunity for us to learn from each other, to expand our own model. But this is something that is nationally recognized. There's federal, on a federal level, there's grant funding um, from the top all the way down to very local small grants. And where can we find these community schools in Lancaster County? Right now, the only community schools are within the school district of Lancaster and the school district or the schools within the school district that currently have community school directors are Lincoln Middle School, Burroughs Elementary, Washington Elementary and Price Elementary. Do you guys want to each claim your schools right now? I know that you're all at I'm, different. <laughs> I'm Price. I'm Washington. I'm at Burroughs. And you, I know you are each affiliated with an organization. Can you just talk a little bit about the organization that you work with and how this work is, is funded and, and works with nonprofit partners? Sure. You want me to take it? <laughs> all right. So we all work for the Boys and Girls Club. The model that our uh, district uses is a lead agency model. And so the district partners with a lead agency who houses us, we are employed by them full time, but we work in the buildings full time. So that enables us to have a connection with a youth serving agency so that when we have questions about before and after school options, we automatically have a resource built in. Um, the mix at Arbor Place is also involved and they host a CSD at Lincoln. Um, we've had other nonprofits in the community serve as lead agencies before and right now um, those are the two that are involved. And do you know anything about the funding model behind the community schools, how that, that gets supported? I do. Yeah, Alex, do you want to take that one? I was going to ask um, specifically in the school district of Lancaster. So the district will contribute some of the funding um, towards the model. And then the lead agency organization also contributes money to that. Um, the district and the nonprofit or the lead agency, they receive their funding for it from different sources. So some of the things like Phoebe already mentioned, they may get grants. Um, from the federal level, the state level, um, there's even local grants. Um, community schools in other areas, they can also, um, if they partner with the university, the university might be um, providing some of that funding. And then in other areas like Philadelphia, um, which is what we had learned about last year, they actually receive some of their money from the city itself 
that they're serving, um, which is a really cool model for that. Okay, so it looks a little bit different based on the community, which is one of the themes that sounds like of the community schools, that they're really tailored to the to the local community. So let's get into some of the nuts and bolts. I'd love to hear what a day in the life of a community schools director looks like. I'm sure every day looks a little bit different. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about some of the programs and um, services that you guys have been able to implement at, at your each of your individual schools. So what I might have been doing this morning may look completely different from what Phoebe or Alex were up to this morning. Um, we had a new family who um, moved here from Turkey. And so we were introducing them to another family from the same region who has been here and who has helped us translate and take a tour of the building um, to become integrated into the community in a um, really organic way. And then I was off to meetings. Phoebe, I don't know, what were you doing at 8.30 this morning? Uh, I started with some friends in the cafeteria who needed a little boost to start their day. Um, I'm always visible during arrival and just, you know, providing, we call it a soft landing, just a safe space to get your Friday jiggles out and get ready for the day. Um, and then I was in a, a building meeting where we were talking about um, different students and their needs. And so we really do bounce around from very micro situations to macro situations. And I think that's something we all like um, because we can go from these heavy systems level, higher up meetings around school organization or partnership organization. And then the next minute we're just chatting with the student, you know, and that it really gives us the best idea of who's in our building and what they need. Um, and also makes our days really interesting. Alex, what were you doing this morning? <laughs> I was actually um, helping the newest community school director. She actually just started at Lincoln uh, recently. So she came over to kind of hear some of the same things that we're talking about now about the community school model, how it looks in this district, um, how it looks like different for each of us each day. Um, kind of walked her around the building, gave her an idea of um, some of the things that she might be asked to do, but also ref like kind of reiterated what Phoebe just said and said, you know, it's, it's not always going to be like that. Um, and that her building needs are completely different than ours, even though they're less than half a mile away from us. Um, it really does differ from uh, neighborhood to neighborhood. And then after that, helping students get shoes that they needed. Um, so again, that kind of individual level, working with them, providing what they need. Um, and some of that stuff we know ahead of time. We know that these families um, need shoes, they need clothes, they need food. Um, but some of the times it's kind of like on that spot, they're walking in and saying, you know, this is something that just happened and they need that and we were able to help them. Um, I think the, the biggest thing for me is the connecting piece. So like connecting between different people within the school, but also outside of the school, outside of the district, um, and kind of just figuring out, we may not always have the answer, but figuring out who might be able to help answer those questions or answer those needs. So you said you work from the, you know, the micro to the macro, and you gave some great examples of the micro it might be, you know, helping a student with, with shoes or welcoming a family from Turkey. Um, but you guys are really on the ground and probably have a very interesting perspective on um, what are some of the greatest needs we're seeing in our schools today. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that macro side. What do you see as some of the maybe big picture issues that your students, their families are encountering and um, what you see as some of the biggest needs in, in at least the schools that you're working in? We are seeing a greater need for um, some social emotional um, struggle gaps to be filled um, and integrated throughout the school day. We have seen that students are now, once we got back to normal school, students are now expected to follow the same rigor as before. And in addition to a multitude of different um, things. I think that that has caused some some gaps between what we are expecting of our kids and what they're really fully capable of performing, for lack of a better word. 
Um, I'm also seeing a lot of the people in our community do value, they value school and they want to see the school as the hub of the community, but they really do need that support to make it feel like it is their, it is their school, it is their hub, and they need us to do a better job with making sure that we're providing um, translation services to make sure that we are connecting them to each other within the community and for them to feel like this is a welcome place for them to be. Would either of you like to add on to that of kind of some of the big picture issues? Yeah, I, I see the same um, social emotional needs in our building um, and we have different partnerships and, and staff that support those needs, but it's, it's just kind of the same as it is with all of the adults in my life. The world is different right now and we all kind of need some extra love. So um, that's one side. I think an, another really big need is housing. Um, the gentrification in Lancaster has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Um, I grew up here, I call it my seven year sabbatical while I was out doing other things, came back to Lancaster and it's it's crazy to see how much it's changed. There is so much growth and so much good change. Um, and at the same time, it's really hard to see families leaving communities that they've been a part of for decades because the housing is so unaffordable. Um, our number of students who are experiencing homelessness is up from last year. Our number of students experience, experiencing food insecurity is up from last year. Um, and just some some anecdotal data around that, I, I we all distribute food every week with a partner called Power Packs. Um, and this year, my attendance has been almost 100% every single week with uh, over 60 families coming to pick up food. So that is twice as many families as were coming last year. So as we see the different rental assistance, utility assistance, food assistance, all of that trickle off post COVID, needs are increasing, inflation, the list goes on and on, right? And, and housing really like the housing security part of it is the foundation that provides a safe place to access all of the other things that we need. Before I follow up on that, I just want to make sure, Alex, if there's anything else you wanted to include, I give you an opportunity. Yeah, <clears throat> I would just reiterate what they had said. Um, I think one of the kind of frustrating things is with the housing piece, students, they build such a good connection with our schools and then they have to go somewhere else because the rent becomes too um, inaffordable for them or the house that they're living in, they need to relocate. To, to find something more attainable and more affordable for them. So it's really tough because, you know, part of our mission is to make sure that they feel welcome and included in the community, and then they have to go somewhere else. So it's, it's really um, a tough situation that obviously as one person, as a community school director, even as a school, you know, it's really hard to address. So working with these other agencies, these other organizations, um, and just talking about it in general, um, bringing it to their attention, because a lot of the times these families, um, they may not have that voice um, in the community yet. And um, it kind of is our role then to, to share that with people that are listening and can, can make the change. Um, I know another issue that comes up a lot is, you know, safety in the schools and uh, making sure that kids are safe both inside the building and outside the building. Um, so. You know, this was something we had heard um, last night at the mayor's address about community safety. Um, and that obviously very much involves the school system um, and the, the youth in the schools, um, whether they're involved as, you know, unfortunately as perpetrators or as um, victims of the, the incidents, but just making sure that kids feel safe in the schools, um, not even just from a security standpoint, but also like the culture of the school and that they feel welcome um, and those social emotional needs are met as well. And I imagine there's a, uh, even outside of traditional safety, thinking about issues like um, street safety and making sure your students are able to get safely um, to school or thinking about lead safety. Some of these have other been 
big themes in the city recently. So I'm sure those are all on your mind. Um, I, I, at the beginning, I said I would love to get to know each of you a little bit better, and I haven't really uh, haven't really dove into that part yet. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about each of you and what made you interested in this work and how you um, became a community school director. So if anyone wants to start with that. It's got to be Bianca. Okay, I will take that first. <laughs> um, so I... <laughs> I am at Price Elementary. Uh, the way that I started was I was involved in our parent teacher organization at Price because I live in the community and all four of my children have gone to Price. Um, at the time that I was involved, my older two, who are 19 and 17, were in elementary school. And a theme that came up was why do certain schools have community schools while others don't? Or why does that school have this after school program? And how can we have that here at our school? So starting as a parent and really having no background knowledge of community school work, or even honestly, how a school works, who is who within a building? How do we make these things happen? What's the difference between fair and equitable when you're having a conversation with someone. Um, those themes started to come out and then there was a neighborhood group called the Southwest Revitalization Project. Uh, they called Price and asked for some participation from the school and then also asked for them to refer them to some parents who may want to be involved. And uh, I got a phone call from the principal and I was involved in that group for many, many years, you know, ever since this evolved into the So We uh, group grant and the grant area, um, I was really, along with other people in our community, you know, I was part of this group who really wanted to see the community school model in our, in our school. Um, a lot of that had to do with there weren't any uh, community schools within the Southwest quadrant of of our city. So that's, um, believe it or not, a shortened version of how I got involved. Uh, I began working at the Boys and Girls Club as a community connector, um, you know, which I wasn't able to do until, you know, my youngest was in kindergarten. She's now in fifth grade. Uh, my first full time year here was her kindergarten year. That's great to see uh, as a parent that that was what made you want to get more involved. Um, what about the rest of you? So I, um, I have a background in a bunch of different like social services, um, mental health, criminal justice. And I think it was right around the pandemic, um, the beginning of like 2020, where I kind of wanted a change in a field um, because of just seeing a lot of the issues that I, the people I was working with. It was challenging because the things that were coming out were things that could have been prevented a long time ago, um, you know, and in, in getting involved earlier on. And I was kind of coming in at the tail end of it. Um, and it was nice to help people at that point, but I really wanted to kind of be able to do things at a larger level and kind of get further, like move that needle upstream a little bit so that I could help earlier on and kind of prevent some of these things, um, which also made me really interested in furthering my education um, so I went on to get a doctorate um, in prevention science, which kind of, um, you know, in that program, we're talking about what are some of the core um, things that are contributing to some of these social issues um, that we've already talked about here and how do we prevent them from happening? Um, so that really tied in really well um, to this work. And when I had found this role, um, I thought it was like the ideal setup because being in an elementary school, I mean, then you're getting involved even earlier in the education um, system as early as you can pretty much get. So that was um, a really big draw for it. And like I mentioned earlier, I think just the collaborative nature of the position is really important because a lot of these things, like it's it's not something that one person or one school um, or one agency can do. So that aspect of going to other people and kind of being creative and bringing them together at the same table that um, really helps to address some of these challenges. 
Thanks, Alex. Phoebe. Um, yeah, so I started around the same time as Alex in, um, started in June of 2020, which was a really fun time to start a job. And I had just finished uh, grad school doing a master's in social work. And I was really intrigued by the idea of being in schools. I had done internships at schools. I had worked at a clinic and found this job and thought, wow, that's kind of same with Alex, the perfect place to do what I like to do. Um, so yeah, I, I really didn't, same as Bianca, I didn't understand the community school model, but the more I dove into it um, and the more that I learned, I felt like this has promised beyond my job here and now. Um, and so it's meaningful to contribute to something that you see having, you know, a lasting impact. Um, and I touched on this a little bit before, but I, I also really like the opportunity to um, get to work on the more clinical social work skills, but not have that be my focus. Um, I really love spreadsheets. Like I really, really do. And so I get to make so many fun spreadsheets usually they're rainbow in a in a classy way and um i i do love like that systems level organization and so i think for a while you, i didn't i didn't know that i could work in that type of role but still do social work kind of work so um this field creates like the perfect marriage and also kids are amazing. They are just the best. And so getting to spend the day in a building full of curious, curious minds, um, it really just helps me stay sane as an adult. You brought up the word impact and I'd love to hear uh, each of you, if you wanna give an example, maybe of a way you feel like you've been able to have impact through your role. Are you going to make me call on you? No. <laughs> I'm just thinking. I, I can go first. Um, I think for me, it's not like one project or one thing that stands out. Um, I think it's been helping kind of shift the overall, like the community school is a model, but it's also kind of a mindset and a perspective of that openness to having the community in the school. Um, and having the community collaborate with different people in the school and then having the school kind of also participate in the community-wide initiatives, um, that back and forth. And I think my impact has been kind of encouraging people within the building to adopt that mindset in a stronger way so that it's not always me bringing these ideas up, it's actually them. You know, they're as somebody in the school, um, a teacher is coming to me and proactively saying like, hey, I thought of this great new organization that I heard about, um, you know, what do you think about bringing them into the school? Um, they may be able to help with this. And I think that's, I'm not trying to say that, you know, I'm trying to make my job easier, um, but everybody likes that. So um, it's, it's just really cool to see too, that these other people in the school that, that that's not their full-time focus are now being proactive and bringing those ideas up. Um, so I think that's been something that I've been proud um, to kind of have that impact on the school. You know, and I would say something along the similar lines as Alex, where whereas you you can build in programs that you bring in based on your data and you know why you're doing it. But, you know, at a certain point, it's, you know, it's not just the programs. It's not just the things that you're doing. It's It's the mentality of the building. It's the climate and culture. It's what he's saying about a teacher saying to you, hey, I just thought of this. What are your thoughts? And it just being part of your school community. And I and I really do think that that's, that's what we've built here at Price. It took, it took a few years, but, and there were some ideas I had that maybe weren't the, you know, the most favorite amongst people due to schedules and feeling like I was trying to jam more things into the day, but now they're just like our artists and residents. They are now just part of how we do business here it is just they are part of our community they're part of our school community and and i think that that yeah. shift has been really important here at price 
Yeah, I I think I've seen the same at Washington. I had a meeting yesterday with, uh, we do like a meeting for new teachers and I was talking to them about community schools. Um, they had all been at different schools within the last couple of years and they all noted such a stark change between where they were and how it is at Washington. Um, the biggest difference that they are seeing is is the connection to resources. They felt like they would see a need in their students and maybe they had someone to go to, but it would be, okay, here's a flyer. That follow through wasn't there. And so um, I think while having the relationship and the community that Alex and Bianca are talking about, that's the foundation that we need and we all have that. And then it's what's that next step connecting to um, the resource and the service to actually solve or try to solve the problem. Um, I think another, there's, there's so many partnerships that we have that are small. And so it's hard for me to even think of one, oh yeah, they did, but there are so many of them that it's hard to say who's had the most impact. Everyone has, but that's the point. I think that's like, that's really the goal is that we're all celebrating student growth together. We're all celebrating community feeling and coming together. I imagine there's a, 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 a lot of partners that you work with in the community. You talked about some big issues today from everything from homelessness to food insecurity. Can you guys talk about just a couple partners that you might work with in the community? I know you won't be able to get through the whole list because uh, there's so many folks that you're working with. Yeah, um, I can start by highlighting uh, one is called the Edible Classroom. Um, we have a courtyard garden at school, which when I started, we were buying mulch and throwing it down to try to just keep the weeds at bay. And it was a beautiful space without dedicated time and resources to make it the best it could be. Um, so we started partnering with them a couple of years ago, and their founders, Beth and Grace, are uh, past teachers who build out their programming that's connected to our curriculum. But my favorite part is that the kids get to see the whole process of what it is to grow and harvest food. So during their health class, they go out and they plant in the summer, they're tending to the garden, they're harvesting, and then cooking with the food that they grow. Um, it's just like the most picturesque, amazing example of what we would love to see. Um, and our, our kids love it, our staff love it. Um, so I think that's definitely one of my proudest partnerships. I think for me, one of um, my proudest partnership is our artists in residence through Millersville University and Art for All, which started as um, looking at our data with our kids and seeing who needed a little help with um, some of feelings of anxiety or depression and really bringing someone in to work alongside the kids and to help with some positive affirmations um, that was with uh, Celise White. We've also had artists from the community come in right after PSSA testing time to give our kids a little bit of a brain break in some ways, but also to have something to look forward to on on those days that are really that they can be really hard on our kids. Um, but we've seen that grow over the past few years, and it's it's really amazing to see that. They are people from our community who come into the classrooms. They may know some of the kids already. One of the artists, Dom, he was actually a student here at Price many years ago. Um, and I know that when, what I've seen is that then the kids, when these artists are also involved in community events, the kids attend the events and then they're so excited to see these people out in the community as well as in their schools. I think um, what's really cool is that these partnerships that we're talking about, like we each have some form of that in our schools. Um, like I have the edible classroom as well at Burroughs. I have the artist in residency at Burroughs as well. Um, so I won't get too much into those because Bianca and Phoebe have already talked about them. But 
I would just echo the idea that both of them have been extremely beneficial to our students. Um, the teachers love them because it builds out the curriculum that they're already talking about. Um, so it really reinforces it in a different way um, that students you know, don't typically get. Um, I think one of the other ones I would highlight is we have a partnership with Bright Now, um, which is an organization that Phoebe and Bianca also both have at their schools. Um, you might be noticing a trend here or a theme that um, the community schools are kind of seen as these perfect areas to pilot these programs um, because of this perspective, this mindset of collaboration. Um, but the Bright Now program, um, they were bringing music into the classrooms and teaching uh, computer and information literacy to the kids at first. Um, so it was very um, technology focused, but using music to do that. Um, which was really cool for kindergartners to, to receive the information that way. Um, and then it's kind of shifted into um, social emotional learning um, through music as well. But again, um, just being that creative piece is really awesome to see how this information can be given to students in a totally different way that's very approachable to them, especially at the elementary level. Um, it's just really cool um, and definitely something that has left an impact for students. So for the people who are listening, how can they support your work or get more involved? So I think one of the biggest ways we're always looking for new partnerships, even though, you know, you've heard a lot about them today, um, that we have a lot. Um, so organizations, agencies, um, faith-based organizations, uh, institutes of higher education, it doesn't matter. Um, we're always looking for different partners, different agencies to become involved in our schools because we know that each brings a unique thing to the table um, and that we can really benefit from that. And a lot of the times um, we may bring in an agency that we then, when they're in the school, they connect with another group or their agency and then that is like this ripple effect for them. Um, I think another way for people to get involved in the school, um, we're looking, we always look for volunteers to kind of help with some of this work. Um, teachers are looking for volunteers to help out in classrooms, um, whether that's coming in to read to a student, whether that's coming in to play in a PE class, play at recess. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a, he a heavy lift. It can be just a little thing. Um, if you're donating 15 minutes of your time, um, that's extremely valuable to us. Um, and then, we kind of mentioned a lot about, you know, the funding piece of community schools and funding comes from either people donating the money, you know, applying for grants, um, getting the funding as part of a budget. Um, so I think one of the biggest things is if, you know, you're someone that is served by a community school, you know, advocating for this work to go further, mm -hmm. um, advocating for this work to continue, um, because that like anecdotal, that qualitative information means a lot um, when, you know, we are applying for grants, we're asking for this kind of money to continue the, the programming. I think one other thing I'll add to that is just, um, I think there are, we're so lucky in Lancaster to have many local businesses who want to support and maybe aren't a child serving agency and that's okay. We we're super creative in figuring out how we can work together. Um, and maybe it's just, you wanna buy us some backpacks. Like it can be so small, right? And so I think, yeah, the best thing to do is just reach out to us and see how we can work together. Uh, but there is no barrier in terms of what you do and what you focus on and what you would like to see. Um, that's, just, that's just our starting point. Anything else you guys want to add before we wrap it up? And I will uh, make sure that we include a link to the community schools page so people can find your contact information and reach out. Um, anything else that we missed? Uh, if not, we'll let people know how they can learn more. I think so. Well, thank you all so much for joining me for the episode. And thanks to everyone who's listening. You can find more episodes of Listening to Lancaster on our YouTube channel and on our website at hourglasslancaster.org. Um, and like I said, we will include a link where people can uh, learn more about the community schools and find a way to get in touch with your local community school director. That's uh, 
to find way, more ways to get involved. So thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. Thank you.